the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. And this one is who we're going to be talking about today. Today's topic is about the Buddha himself. Let's see, is there anybody who I do not recognize? I remember Princess. I think I remember Wish. Wish, have you ever been to any of my talks before or, or activities? Yeah, okay. So, I thought so. <laughs> so, we have no, uh, we have all old friends here. So, I don't need to go through the whole introduction. We'll go right into the topic. I did a, uh, when I first started doing these Dhamma talks, one of the original talks, um, I did a talk about the Buddha and I thought that I recorded it and put it on my YouTube channel but I didn't I think this was before I decided to start recording these so uh, I figured you know what? it's about time to uh, talk about our good buddy the Buddha <laughs> or as uh, the Lodro from uh, <laughs> in that book that I finished reading uh, the Buddha goes into the bar he calls him my buddy Sid and I kind of like that, so now I, that's what I do. I call him my buddy Sid. <laughs> I think it works perfect. So, who is this guy, the Buddha, right? You know, I'm sure most of us know, like, the basic story. You know, he was Siddhartha Gautama. He was this prince who, you know, was, uh, who grew up in luxury. And, you know, there was, when he was born... There was uh, these soothsayers who held up two fingers and said that he would either be a world conqueror, a world ruler, or a Sammasambuddha, you know, an enlightened being. And of course there was the one, um, I think it was Kundanya, if I'm not mistaken, and he, st and he just said, he will be, and he was crying, and, and they asked why he was crying, he goes, because I will not be able to to be alive when this person teaches the Dhamma. So, obviously that's what happened, right? He, he became the Buddha. Yes, in northern India, in the foothills of uh, the Sakyan clan area, it's right in the, uh, the foothills of the Himalayas. So, we're going to go over... Uh, I don't believe that they were... Because I think Brahmanism is actually different than Hinduism. That I, I, I can't go too far into that because I, I don't know. That's knowledge that I'm not really knowledgeable about. But I'm pretty sure that Brahmanism is actually different than Hinduism. So the Brahmins, if you read the suttas, that's all you hear about the, the Buddha talking about the Brahmins. The Brahmins this, the Brahmins that. In many of the suttas, the Buddha, Brahmins come to the Buddha to ask him questions or to debate, or to debate him and these kind of things. And as a matter of fact, the, the Buddha <coughs> kind of flips it around on people, right? And he uses the term Brahmin to be somebody who... Um, because remember back then we're talking about the caste system we're talking about reincarnation where if you were born uh, an untouchable that's what you were for the rest of your life if you were born a Brahmin that's what you were for the rest of your life there was no upward mobility as you as we call it here in America There's, there was no upward mobility back then so when we uh, when you hear the term Brahmin um, you know, the Brahmins were these, you know, uh, rich, uh, like, um, the upper class. They were the ones who knew how to do the sacrifices and the oblations to the gods so that, you know, you could have good luck, these kind of things. And that's how they were paid. So, their suttas where the Buddha talks about, a Brahmin is not somebody who was born into it. A Brahmin is somebody who... Uh, becomes wise through his own actions, etc. And this is what part of what we're going to talk about the Buddha. The Buddha was like, uh, I mean, you know, he was the ultimate rebel. He was the ultimate, you know, uh, what's it called? If you 
think about like the 60s and you think about like Gandhi and well it's Gandhi's from the the 20s and the 30s you think about Martin Luther King the Buddha was like you know the ultimate rebel even like 2600 years before these two (laughs) the old yeah exactly so we have this guy Siddhartha Gautama right and he grows up in the lap of luxury but he's he's, he's always questioning and I was and he was thinking like what well, this not really feel a hundred percent. Of course you got the story then of the um the four significant visions, right? Where he wants to go out and see the world and the father tries to hide everything, um, from tries to make it all nice. But he goes out and he sees an old person and he's like, well, Who the hell is this? What the, what's this person? What's this creature? <laughs> And China goes, hey, this is an old person. We're all going to be like this. And then so likewise for um, a sick person, a dead person. So he saw old age sickness and death for the first time in, in his almost 30 years of life. This is what, how the story goes. And then he saw a monk. And he says, heck, you know, I think those monks, the Samaneras, that's what they called them at the time. The renunciates, the Samaneras. Um, I think these guys probably have uh, the right idea of it. So he, you know, he cuts his hair and he goes out and he becomes a monk. And for six years, he's striving and striving and he does all kinds of stuff that, you know, they thought back then that if you punished your body, you might be able to find, um, you know, enlightenment. So that's what he did. I mean, the, the, the sutta story says, like, the Buddha's talking about how you could feel the his you know he could feel his spine by by touching his stomach and stuff like that so and then he found out oh well, this is kind of futile this is silly you know he, he went from living the life of complete sensual luxury to a life of complete um uh what you call it why did i miss that word <laughs> to uh, uh wow i can't remember the word what is it yeah, the ascetic, the um, punishing, punishing the body, the complete. So he tried both extremes, right? And he says, nah, these two ways, eh, they don't kind of work, do they? Let's see this middle path. And, you know, this is where he became this enlightened being, and and um, the, the rest is history, as they say. He began his ministry, his teaching. So... We, what I like to talk about here is who is the Buddha and why is that important and how should we view the Buddha now you know there are the Buddha in the suttas he said himself that he, there is no there is no one Buddha there are many Buddhas before there are many Buddhas after right Uh, In the Theravada tradition, which is really the only tradition I kind of know, you know, I I can't really speak to the others, but I do know that the Buddha is viewed differently, not only depending on the tradition, but also like the culture, the country. The Buddha is viewed very differently in a variety of different places. Um, So in the Theravada tradition, what a Buddha is, a Buddha is a person who became enlightened with no teacher, right? So a Buddha arises every couple aeons after the Dhamma has been forgotten. And he finds it, he strives and finds the Dhamma on his own, and then he teaches it. And the rest of us, we're in the age of Sakyamuni Buddha. Because obviously the Dhamma is still around, right? 2,600 years after he's his passing away, we're still here, virtually, or in you know, or in the real world, going to monasteries. We're still practicing and spreading Dhamma. So, you now this is, uh, and when we become enlightened, we're considered arhats because we uh, were enlightened with the help of teachers. So the, the the only difference between, at least in the Theravada tradition, the only difference between us and the Buddha 
is that he found it on his own. And you know, one of the things that really connected me to the Buddha at first was the fact that he was just a regular guy. I mean, <clears throat> in the suttas, he's considered, a, you know, a super mundane which means like beyond normal. So he, he technically wasn't an, a regular guy. But the reason why he had these super mundane abilities um, and this super mundane mind was because of his practice through the aeons. It wasn't because he was born special or because he is somehow n n above humans or anything like that. It's just he's just a regular guy who practiced. And that's what makes me, it's kind of like, <laughs> it's almost kind of like, like if you grow up, like especially if you're a boy, you have these favorite superheroes, right? And who's the people's favorite superheroes? Spider-Man, Superman, this and that. I always liked Batman. You know why I always liked Batman? Because he was just a regular guy. I always felt like I could be Batman, you know? That makes sense. I could be Batman. Of course, I just have to be rich and then I could have all these gadgets and stuff but I don't need to come from the planet Krypton or be bitten by a spider or something like that I can be Batman it's the same thing with the Buddha I can be I can do what the Buddha did and that's the amazing thing about it that's what really drew me to this like wow I can do this just me as this just regular human dude I can do this you know, I can become enlightened. I can walk in the Buddha's footsteps. And, you know, practice the Dhamma and realize the deathless or unbinding, the two terms for Nibbana or Nirvana. That's what connects me. And that's what, you know, a lot of us, Westerners especially, we have kind of issues and we have a lot of questions with regards to going for refuge, right? I go for refuge to the Buddha. I go for refuge to the Dhamma. I go for refuge to the Sangha. And I had issues with this too. It's like, what's this going for refuge in this bowing and this stuff? What, what, what's really, what, what's this all about? And you know what, I, I came to the conclusion, that, and this is what I do when I bow, when I give uh, go for refuge to the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, right? And I do my bow. I, I go for refuge to the Buddha, the awesome dude. That's what I call him, the awesome dude. <laughs> Both in the modern, uh, the modern uh, meaning and also the literal meaning, awesome as in amazing, like that this person can could do this, you know, that he could f find this enlightenment, and that he was able to help others and to teach this and to give Dhamma to the others. Now, to me, this, so, so the first is I go for refuge to the Buddha, the awesome dude, right? He's the awesome dude. He's, he's my buddy Sid, right? <laughs> he's, uh, yeah, he's the guy who came before. And you know what I found out? It's part of the, um, just recently I found this out, which made even more sense to me. The Budang Saranangachami, that's going, I go for refuge to the Buddha. What that also implies is it's not a, f a following or a worshiping of the Buddha, it's following in his footsteps. That So that you're, you're going for refuge in the Buddha, that you are walking the path of Dhamma. You are practicing the path. So, and what's the next one after that? That is... Dhammang Saranangachami. I go for uh, refuge to the Dhamma. What's the Dhamma? The Dhamma is truth. So I go for refuge to the Buddha, the awesome dude. I go for refuge to the Dhamma, the truth of reality. And the last one, Sangang Saranangachami. I go for refuge to the Sangha. And what are the Sangha? The Sangha are the keepers of Dhamma, the keepers of the truth. So for me, that's how I do the refuge. And that's how it, co it connects in my mind. So that the, so the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, that's how it, it works for me. And it makes sense in my mind in that way. Because that means it's very important. It's very important for the, to go to the truth for refuge, right? And there's these two aspects, two 
alternate aspects of the truth. There's the 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 cool dude, our buddy Sid, who found this truth. That by the way, he didn't create this truth. He you know th this is a truth that has always existed, and that he found. He he used the analogy of the um, an ancient path rediscovered, right? Suppose you would find this path and you'd go down it and you'd see this old city with parks and groves and everything and you'd go back to your king and you'd say, rebuild this city so that it can thrive once more. That's like that. That's what the Buddha described as what he did finding the Dhamma. So, you know, and of course, like I was saying before uh, that I didn't go to too detail with, there's many Dom, there's many Buddhas before this Buddha, there's many Buddhas after. The big one now is Maitreya Buddha, right? This is something that's uh, discussed, I think, a little bit more in the Mahayana, but even in Theravada they discuss this too, um, which is supposed to be the next Buddha who's going to usher in a new age and all this stuff. I'm, I'm not too familiar with that. Um, but that is the nature of a Buddha, right? They, they, they are these beings who are just like us. Although, I guess in the Mahayana, I think they're a little bit more than just regular humans. Although, again, I don't want to... I really hesitate to talk about something I don't know anything about. <laughs> I know very, very little um, with regards to the other traditions, so I don't want to talk about too much uh, about that and misrepresent the truth. But, for me... The Buddha is just a regular guy who achieved an extraordinary thing. And the fact that we can also follow in his footsteps and do that is also extraordinary. It gives me hope, right? It gives me hope that I can do that. That there is this thing uh, called enlightenment. That's this, this changing of your mindset. That, and you can do that. You can live in there. You can live with that mindset, you can become that mindset, and you can never be reborn again, get out of samsara. You can say, yeah, I'm out of this piece, have fun, <laughs> I'm getting out of here. <laughs> or if you want to take the bodhisattva vows in the Mahayana, you can stick around and try to help others. <laughs> How do we really become a Buddhist? There's a I I joined this this online Buddhist community. It's called NewBuddhist.com, and that was one of the questions. What makes you a Buddhist? <laughs> My answer was, I observe the present moment. <laughs> That's what makes me a Buddhist. Yes, officially, in the Buddhist tradition or religion, however you want to call it going for refuge and taking on the five precepts is what in parentheses makes you a Buddhist but we know we're trying to get rid of the ists right all these concepts the Buddhists there's no such thing as a Buddhist in the Buddhist time <laughs> that's a, a modern invention as it were but uh Okay, so where was I going? Yes. So we have this guy, the Buddha. And I go back to a little bit of like the whole rebel thing, right? The rebel. And he grew up in a he he lived in a time where again, there was rebirth, but you were static. You couldn't you were stuck in your birth. But the, but the Buddha said, "No, no, 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 no." The only thing that matters is your kama. What's your kama? Kama is action. What you do. What matters and what makes you who you are is what you do. That was like a, you know, an, an unheard of statement at the time. That was like, whoa, that's amazing. <laughs> is that really true? So, you know, anybody, no matter who it was, the lowliest, you know, uh, lowliest worker, peasant, whoever, to the highest 
Rodman. The only thing that mattered is what you did. Your actions, your comma. So that really went against the grain. And you'll see the Buddha says that this practice goes against the grain. And the more you see the practice, the more you read the suttas, you see that it goes against against the grain in many, many ways. There's tons of ways it goes against the grain. So not only that, but then we have also the creation of the bhikkhuni sangha, right? Is that not unheard of to have women 2,600 years ago to become monks or nuns? I don't necessarily like the term monks and nuns because it's very, it's very modern, it's very uh, westernized. So I just kind of like to use the words bhikkhu and bhikkhuni. So the bhikkhuni sangha, the women, right? The women who became great teachers, who became enlightened. Unheard of back then. Unheard of. This is the Buddha, again, going against the grain, right? Now, of course, the story is that he initially said no to forming the bhikkhuni sangha. But his aunt and the person who nursed him, Maha Pajapati, she asked to become ordained. And the Buddha said no. And, you know, it doesn't really give an answer as to why he said no. So that's debated these days. But, so a second time, she asked and he said no. And he, he went, uh, the story goes that he went to another place and Mahapajapati go to me, this woman, she cut off her hair, she put on robes. And back in the day, you put robes together from, from cloth from dead people in the charnel grounds. You didn't have lay people who gave you robes, right? So you put these, so she cut off her hair and she put on these robes from dead people, um, and she went off to see the Buddha. And she went in front of the Buddha and she was all bloody and everything from her travels. And she had no hair and everything and all that. And she asked again and the Buddha said no. But then Venerable Ananda said, Can women attain enlightenment as men? And the Buddha said, yes, they can. And the, uh, Venerable Ananda said, This is the person who um, who fed you and who took care of you who breast, like breastfed him and stuff when your mom died because uh, the mo Buddha's mother died when he I think it was three or four years three or four days old so Mahapajapati go to me who is his aunt a nurse you know nurse she basically raised him so Ananda said that and, and he says you know, yes, I agree. So that's when the Bhikkhuni Sangha came about. And of course, there's some there's some extra rules for the Bhikkhunis that in our modern mindset today, we would say, oh, that, that's unfair, that's sexist, you know, if you read these rules and stuff like that. But even still, for 2,600 years ago, we're talking about, we're talking about the time where Rome, ancient Rome, was just like uh, an early republic. This is a long time ago. You know, Romulus and Remus were, were uh, <laughs> barely, you know, a hundred years out of forming Rome when the Buddha was alive and teaching. So this is a long time ago. So the fact that there was even a Bhikkhuni Sangha is amazing to begin with. And so we have this guy, the Buddha, doing all these, shaking up the uh, the establishment. Right? <laughs> he's the anti-establishment guy. He's the one who's there, and he's shaking up the establishment, and he's you know telling people that it doesn't matter how you're born, but what you do, and these kind of things. So. One of the other things I guess I wanted to talk about is, have you ever heard of the, uh, the phrase, 
it's a phrase from a, a Zen master. If you see the Buddha on the road, kill him. Have you ever heard of that phrase? And what, what have you guys heard as to what that means? Yeah, it's a killing the ego, but it's a, it's about not having. If you think you have a, a view of what who the Buddha was or what what he is or how he's supposed to be, then think again. <laughs> yeah, get the, the break the the thought of that. I mean, people first hear that, it says, "Oh my God, what is, that sounds bad." <laughs> Kill the, if you see him on the road, kill him. <laughs> what are you supposed to be, Angulimara? <laughs> Great heart, na uh, namaste to you as well. It's always good to see you, friend. So, uh, you know, we, we have this guy, the Buddha, and in a lot of ways, it, it is good to. Now, do you know that the first Buddha statues only came about? about 500 years after the Buddha's death before that there were no Buddha statues supposedly before that this, there, there was a symbol the symbol of the Buddha was a footprint and it had the eightfold path the, the spokes the wheel the eight spoke wheel that was the symbol of the Buddha so you know, of course, these things come about later. And now we have this supposed visual. Of course, we don't know what the Buddha looked like. But you could probably just go to India and look at people. And that's pretty, yeah, he probably looks like that, you know. Just like it's the same thing like how Jesus, where, where if you grew up Catholic, you know, our, our present representation of what Jesus looks like is totally European, right? You go to go to the Middle East and see one of the guys with the with the Arab headdresses, that's what Jesus looked like, you know? <laughs> so we don't know what the Buddha really looked like, but we have this representation. I, I in a lot of ways I do kind of like the the Buddha as Keanu Reeves. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> ah, boy. But uh, yeah, Keanu Reeves played the Buddha in Little Buddha. If you've never seen it, <laughs> I think he did a decent job. But anyway, from what we know, <laughs> yes, it was a great movie. So in a lot of ways, it's not really what the Buddha means or who the Buddha is. In a lot of ways, doesn't really matter as much as his message. At the end of his life, in the Parinibbana Sutta, which is very long, I'm I'm reading it now. It's like 40 pages. A sutta that's for it's in the the Dijinikai, which is in the long discourses. So th this this Parinibbana Sutta is like 40 pages long. And one of the things, and this always struck me as well. Very, it struck me very deeply when Ananda said, "Who will lead us when you are gone?" Who will teach the Dhamma? Who will lead us? And the Buddha said, The Dhamma is your teacher. This Dhamma that I have taught, let it be your guide. Let it be your teacher. And that amazed me too, because, you know, this is, you know, I, I was raised Catholic, so I, you know, Catholic Christians, you have this, like, the Pope. The Pope's the head guy, right? And no matter where you are in the world, the Pope is the top. And, I, and and when I first read this, and 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 this is Buddha says, eh, nobody, the teaching itself, the teaching itself, and I said, wow, that's amazing. The teaching is the most important thing. There doesn't need to be any Buddha Pope, you know, or or Buddha number two, Buddha number three. Just the teaching itself. I was on another forum, and somebody, one of the questions was, 
the Theravadins have like a leader, like the Dalai Lama. And somebody made made the uh, the comment, yeah, the suttas, <laughs> the Dhamma is our leader. Uh, but uh, so that that is um, you know what the Buddha said. There is no you know the Dhamma is, and to me that's while I hold very great respect for the Buddha and great respect for the Sangha the most important thing of those three for me at least in my mind is the Dhamma that's the most important thing another part of the Parinibbana Sutta is there is a part and again this struck me very deeply where all the his disciples are weeping and and they're they're taking care of him and they're next to him and and there's this one disciple who's who's out you know away from the crowd under a tree meditating and they said master look at this guy he doesn't care about you know you or the dhamma or anything blah 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 you know like they they berated this guy who wasn't like you know at the master's feet weeping and all this stuff and the buddha said this is my son this is my son meaning this guy is doing what I taught. <laughs> this guy is what you're doing, what you're, what you're supposed to be doing. So, and this is, uh, you hear the term sons of the Sakyans, right? These are the sons of the Buddha. That's a term that the people call these people. What we would say were Buddhists today, back then they were called the sons of the Sakyan. Because Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama was from the Sakyan people. And so he's a Sakin. So all of these things, this is these things that to me connected so much, that made so much sense to me, that it just made me feel like this Buddha, this guy Siddhartha, good old our buddy Sid, is an amazing, amazing person. And worthy of my respect. You know, I, I didn't, as a Westerner, even though I knew that bowing doesn't, like, to us, bowing is like some kind of worshipping, like, you know, like, worshipping God or worshipping idols or whatever, like, you know, like, we think of bowing, that's what we think. But in Asian countries, bowing is just respect. So when you're bowing, you three bow three times, you're just respecting, you're not worshipping. And, and I don't think that, I really don't think that there's any tradition or sect that really worships the Buddha in our Western perception of what worship is. You know, we respect the Buddha as this person who who gave us these teachings. You know, th- this is this person. E- even, even with the statues of the Buddha, even the statues of the Buddha are not supposed to be worshipped. You know, I, so, there's some cultural things that you get, like people feel like they need to have a little Buddha statue around their neck for superstitious reasons or ceremonial reasons or these things. And, and that, that's a cultural addition. That's, that's just how it goes, right? But we know that really that these things are just, can do nothing. They can do nothing but remind us of how we should be practicing and living. There's a story of Ajahn Chah. Um, a, uh, one of his disciples uh, was drafted into the army. He had to become a soldier. Um, in Thailand at the time there was a civil war. And the, the, the t- disciple goes up to Ajahn Chah and says, Oh, let me have one of those little Buddhas that are blessed. That'll help me so I don't die, so I don't get shot. <laughs> And uh, Ajahn Chah says, oh, "If you don't want to be shot, then don't join the army." <laughs> Basically, like that's that's a comma, right? If you're gonna, uh, you know, that that's the comma of a soldier is that you have the risk of being shot. So he kept saying, and this is a disciple who learned from Ajahn Chah, so he should know better than to ask, you know, to 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 feel like this. But when you have this fear, right? Could you imagine you okay you're in the army and you get you might get shot you know you know you might get killed so of course 
if you have greed, hatred, and delusion, which you do unless you're enlightened, you're going to have these fears, right? So it, the fear kind of like overtook him. So he's like, I, I need one of these little Buddha statues, you know, to put around my neck. That'll help me from getting shot. So he kept pushing the Buddha, I mean the Buddha. He kept pushing Ajahn Chah. And Ajahn Chah says, okay, okay, I have a Buddha that will stop bullets for you. And the, and the disciple's like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Where is it? And he pointed to the big 15-foot-tall Buddha statue. <laughs> and the thing he says, there it is right there. <laughs> uh, that's Ajahn Chah for you. Ajahn Chah is the best. <laughs> I, I wish, uh, and too bad he's been dead 20 years, But the, all, and all we have left are the writings of him. But... Uh, <laughs> It's just it's such a thing as, as amazing as that. And Ajahn Brahm talks about a story of this general who spent, uh, from Thailand again, who spent, I think it was like a million dollars US and bought this expensive, famous Buddha necklace, you know, Buddha thing that's supposed to, you know, and he believed it would stop bullets. And one day they were like you know he was I guess drunk and he was with his officers and and he said you know he he bet he says I give you an order to shoot me to one of his officers and because he, he had I guess in his drunken state and, you know in his belief he believed that 100 percent that this statue that he spent a million dollars on that goes around his neck would stop a bullet well guess what happened he died <laughs> So obviously that didn't work out too well. But, you know, this is where we get into the superstitions beyond, you know, where we get into superstitions and beliefs that go beyond the Buddha himself and beyond what the Buddha wanted us to talk, to practice. So we don't want to get too enthralled into this Buddha statue, this Buddha image. Right? And this is where the whole kill the Buddha if you see him comes from. Because it's get, that's taking us away from the message and the practice. That's the most important thing. And as we know from that story that I said about the guy met the, the, the monk meditating, if we want to respect the Buddha, if we want to do what the, the Buddha would want us to do, it's the practice, not to worry about Buddha statues or, you know, who the Buddha was or, or the Buddha wouldn't like this, the Buddha wouldn't like that, just to practice. That's it. The Buddha would want you to practice. <laughs> he says it a million times in the suttas. Death is coming. Old age is coming. You know, <laughs> the, don't waste your time. Just practice. <laughs> Practice, practice, practice. What are you wasting your time for? So that's what I that's what I hear. I have the Buddha's final words up on my my wall. The Buddha's final words were, "All conditioned things are impermanent. Strive diligently for your own release." Right. So I have strive diligently on my wall in my and at home and also at work and the, the word is apamadena sampadetta strive diligently that to me that's those final words of the buddha are like a a call a calling he this is this is the culmination of everything that he said strive diligently because they know there's nobody that's going to strive for you. <laughs> there's nobody that's going to, you know, bring you to enlightenment. You have to do it yourself. So strive diligently. That is his message to us. That is who the Buddha is. And I guess that's probably all I have to say at this point. So, uh, if we want to discuss more about the Buddha, how he's viewed differently, different places, any questions, anything like that, we can discuss that. How you view the Buddha, 
you know, feel free to to discuss that as well. We know that this is a an open Dhamma discussion as always. And we always prefer there to be uh, participation rather than me blabbing on for 40 minutes. At least that's what I prefer. <laughs> So far away in time, I gotta do. I gotta. I gotta read something for you. Uh, let me see. I wrote it in my journal during my last retreat, and I gotta see if I can find it about the Buddha in time. Here it is. I found it. I wrote that I was thinking, I was doing my walking meditation, and I thought about uh, when people say about in the time of the Buddha, or, you know, these things about the Buddha feels so far away. This is what I thought and I wrote. The Buddha's time is now. He never taught any other time. When you are in the present moment, you are with the Buddha. He is asking you to come and see. You are living his teaching and that is how you respect him so when you are in the present moment you're with the Buddha because you're in the time that he taught <laughs> he only taught the present moment what do, what do I always say the the future doesn't exist the past doesn't exist future and the past are just concepts of our mind they don't really exist the past is gone it's what happened. The future hasn't come yet. The only thing that the only time that exists is the present moment right now. Yes. So, you don't have to <coughs> feel that you're too far away from the Buddha cuz the Buddha's right there. When you close your eyes and when you breathe and when you're in that the present moment, there he is. That's where he is. And plus, I also, I guess there is a, a matter of perspective with your comment, too. As somebody who kind of lived a lot of his life in the past, <laughs> as a, a lover of history, um, you know, it, it's kind of, it's easier for me to, to be like, like, uh, connect myself to, like, the time of Caesar, or the time of Alexander the Great, to imagine what it would be like to be at that time and stuff like that so I've always done that my whole life and like recently I do kind of imagine like, oh, what would it be like to be at the time of the Buddha to have listened to him talk you know to see the crowds and all that stuff I do think about that in my wanderings but what is that it's wasting time isn't it <laughs> it's thinking about the past I'm thinking about the Buddha 2600 years ago when he's right in the present whenever I'm there that's where he is because he the teaching is the present I like that Griffith that's a that's a good way of putting it I think he points the way you can't. It's, you can't lead the horse to water. You can only point the way, right? <laughs> yeah, this is this is the way. Now go walk it yourself, because I can't help you. <laughs> Thank you.
So, you know, I've, I've talked about this before, too. I just want to add, add this a little bit when I was talking about the bowing and stuff like that. There, there were times where I felt like I had such an insight or a breakthrough or, or I felt such a respect for the Buddha and, like, the message. Like, when I, when I, when I go through these moments where, like, holy crap, like, you know, I, this is what the Buddha said was right, you know? <laughs> And I have these like moments, and it's like, wow, this is, you know, this is. What I feel like bowing, you know. I feel like this is a, this respect. Like this one time where I was the last person in the meditation hall, and I had a struggling meditation all day, and I, you know, was there, and I was alone by myself at night in the meditation hall with just the one candle, and the last person blows out the candle, right? So I got up, and I got like you know, right in front of, below this big statue, Buddha statue, and I just bowed, and I stayed bowed, and I just had this, this reverence, this respect for this teaching, and for the Buddha, and that was an amazing, that, that was kind of like an amazing experience for me, and it wasn't that this statue was like, you know, coming alive or anything like that it, it wasn't that I was revering the statue it was that I was developing a confidence which is real well, I mean we say faith but really in the Buddhist Buddhist term what we mean is confidence because when we we think faith we often think of like a blind faith in Western society but in faith in Buddhism the term is confidence seeing it for yourself you know that it works, so you have faith in it, and that's that's what I have. I have faith, um, even though I haven't. Maybe I haven't seen very far into the teaching yet, but I've seen enough to know that from what I've seen, you know, I I can verify its truth with my own experience. And if it ever comes a time where I can't, or where I verify a truth that's different, then. I'll have to deal with it when I get to that point, but so far, you know, this is why I have this respect. And, and it, 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 maybe it's a different type of respect than like maybe a Sri Lankan or somebody who grew up in in a culture of Buddhism, you know, but in a way I kind of, I think it's a better way of, of looking at things rather than doing it because you kind of grew up and you think you feel like you have to do it you do it because like wow this is you know amazing like you have this true real reverence this real respect there is um i've i've been able to speak to enough sri lankans to know oh it, the, one of the first the uh insights that i found that really cracked me up <laughs> was grow, um, growing up a, a Catholic, you know, we, we, we used to talk about these people called, and I went to Catholic school, I did the Eucharistic, uh, Eucharistic minister, altar boy, all that stuff, before I was able to escape it. <laughs> but uh, growing up, we talked about these C&E Catholics, Christmas and Easter, right? They're these, these Catholics that they never went to church every every week they never really did anything they just came to church you know because they kind of were raised catholic and you know they felt like they had to go to church on christmas and easter because it's important right so or, or see me catholics and then i found out holy crap there's such a thing as cne buddhists <laughs> i was like really is that but you know what being a student of humanity uh, an anthropology major i should have knew that I should have realized that humans are, no matter what belief, no matter what tradition, philosophy, humans are humans. So there's really no difference between a Catholic human and a Buddhist human. There really isn't. The, the same greed, hatred, and delusion is there. So, are there people who grew up Buddhist, and they're like, well, I, I have to go to Wessex, and I have to go to Katina, but I ain't gonna go and meditate or any, do anything else like that. Yeah, there's plenty of them. I've spoken to a lot of them. <laughs> and I've spoken to, uh, which, which um, gladdens my heart, I've spoken to some young Sri Lankans who their parents are like that, but they actually come 
and they don't really care much about the the um, the tradition aspect of it or the the uh, rites and rituals aspect but they want to come and they want to meditate and I was like yeah that's great let's meditate together let's you know because that's the that's the real thing to me that in my maybe that's a you know, I, there is a Western Westerner arrogance still in me. I think where, we, where I kind of feel like, like, oh, like you know, they, you know, I don't have to worry about having these cultural additions, so I can just go right, you know, follow the the, the direct teachings and just practice. And and you know, I don't know. There's still some of that arrogance in me. I'm certainly not enlightened, <laughs> but I try to be a, as observant of that as possible. That's what we have to do. Um, so I try not to judge, but to me, it's all you know. The my teachers, Bonte G, Bonte Silananda, the uh, Ajahn Cha, Ajahn Brahm, all the the, the, the the monks that are who I consider my teachers, they repeat the same thing that the Buddha said in the suttas: practice, practice, practice. The most important thing is to practice. So. I believe I said okay well that's okay then that's what I'm going to do I'm going to (laughs) practice you know I'm not going to worry about all this extra stuff that supposedly as you go along in the practice your dependence on rites and rituals goes away anyway you know when you become a stream enterer so you know there is definitely uh, that aspect of it, it, where I consider it almost like a a detriment to a being I, I consider it that I was blessed that I wasn't born in a Buddhist country that I can practice the Dhamma free from any uh, cultural trappings as it were Well, there's this tradition of merit, making merit, right? And even in the Buddhist time, I mean, because the Buddha talks about this in a couple of suttas, that making merit, they uh, they feel like, and, you know, and I spoke this, uh, spoke about this when I did my talk, maybe it was about a month ago, about the job of a lay person. I don't know, I think you were there, evil. And I... You know, I went over what that one monk said in, in the uh, the PDF about how there is this 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 belief that in this tradition that has come about that it's the job of lay people to ju- to take care of the monks and to make merit. But the Buddha didn't believe that. The Buddha said, "Greater than uh, there's this one thing greater than because uh, Anasapindika, who is a very very big donator to the Sangha. I mean, he he was one of the you know almost single-handedly kept the Sangha growing and going for a long time. You know, he's a very rich person who wanted to to pra- you know to to support the Buddha. And so one of the suttas the Buddha's talking about, uh, and this is just talking about metta, not even just practice in general, but just specifically metta. The Buddha said, greater than donating 300 large jars of dana is practicing metta for one minute. So even greater than all of this merit that you think, you, because the, the idea is you, you develop merit and that gives you a better rebirth, right? So the Buddha said, you know, the Buddha said, and, and, I, and I, I agree, he says, why do you want a better rebirth? Why why don't you want to just get rid of rebirth altogether? <laughs> Start practicing, you know. That's what it personally, I don't want a better rebirth. You know, if if I can if I can strive diligently and uh, you know, try to do the best that I can, I want to be, you know, I want to move towards enlightenment if possible, you know. <laughs> I don't I don't want a better rebirth. I want no rebirth. I like I like uh, the concept of the deathless. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, then you'll get into the whole thing that, you know, if you strive, if you want Nibbana, then you'll never have it, right? Well, the Buddha says that you can. The Buddha says that in, in, your, in your lifetime as a human, you can attain enlightenment. 
depends on how you, if you practice, depends on if you put in the effort. Then you've already beaten yourself. <laughs> right? The, our battle is the, me and, uh, and Arturo were talking about this just uh, before we started, right? Arturo was talking about his practice and how he feels like the biggest battle is with himself. And I posted a link, um, a quote that I have of the Buddha. It's one of my favorite quotes. Let me post it again. just have to copy paste it here because I want to get the full wording instead of just kind of paraphrasing it. And this is from the um, I believe it's from the Anguttara Nikaya, which is the numbered discourses, because it has numbers in it. Let's see, here we go. No one may conquer a thousand times a thousand men in battle, yet he indeed is the noblest victor who conquers himself. Anything outside is not a battle. The true battle is with yourself. So don't count yourself short, Damaris. <laughs> don't, uh, I know, you can practice. Whether, whether whether you get there or not, no, nobody can know. You know what I talk about, my insights, right? When I, I've I and you you've all heard me say this before, and I say that I, I'm at the point where I don't worry about insights when they come. You know, I I know that if I practice, they'll come. Just like the the Kevin Costner movie, if they build it, they'll come. I know that if I practice, it'll come. Whether, whether I become enlightened in this lifetime, I don't know. You know, of course, you know, I, anybody would want and would like to. Yeah, I'll be enlightened. <laughs> but I don't know if I'll be enlightened. But what I do know is that the practice is beneficial here and now. And hopefully I'll, you know, if it's not this lifetime, hopefully it's the next lifetime. I don't know. <laughs> but don't sell yourself short. The best thing to do is to not necessarily worry about it too much. Just keep practicing. Practice as much as you can. And if that's just five minutes a day, two times a week, if you really can't practice any more than that, then just keep that going. Well now, uh, thank you. I guess <laughs> I, th I think I think my name is bad enough of a of a head uh, a head uh, what you call it bigger upper, um, <laughs> but that uh, is also a big help in destroying my ego as well. <laughs> I you know what my name is, right? what my name means Giantha Giantha let's see if you remember <laughs> big headed yeah I certainly am I've always had a big head literally and figuratively <laughs> it means victorious one so I said, oh, thanks for the name, Bonte. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> as if it's as if I'm not trying. I'm 
try already trying to get rid of my ego. I get to have this this name, victorious one. That helps. <laughs> well, it, when I um when I took the noble uh, the eight lifetime precepts, yeah, I, Bonte G, um, Bonte S, they gave me this name. So when when you take the eight the eight lifetime precepts, you get a, a poly name. That's basically yeah, no pressure, right? <laughs> Well, when I was on my knees and, and Bhante G gave me the, the little diploma, whatever, and, and he said, oh, you have a very auspicious name. It means victorious one. And I'm like, well, as long as it means victorious in the battle against myself, I'm okay. And uh, <laughs> and he says, oh, you know what it means. And I said, well, good. <laughs> but yeah, so so uh, that was my addition to JT, Mr. Oh, I'm a great teacher. I said, thanks. Like, my head's not big enough, right? <laughs> but, I'm, uh, that's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to get rid of the ego. So, I'm not a great teacher. You know what's a great teacher? These, these five aggregates. <laughs> these five aggregates are, are pr a pretty good teacher, I guess. I know, but all these five aggregates have, have done is learn from other five aggregates who are our good teachers and also observe itself, right? Because <laughs> we are nothing but five aggregates. Form, feeling, perception, mental formations, and consciousness. At least that's what I tell myself to lower my head. <laughs> to make it smaller. <laughs> okay. So I guess uh, we're past 10, but if there's any other questions or anything, then we can do that or we can end. <clears throat> well, this is this is one of the reasons, JT, I, I feel like I uh, um, am destined to become a, a monk. Not only for my own practice, but I feel like I was born to teach Dhamma to Westerners because what I feel like is I was this Westerner who was kind of lost, right? Who who didn't really, I mean, I knew who, I knew in a lot of ways who I was, but I didn't have this connection to anything. It didn't make nothing made much sense. And then I found Theravada Buddhism. Like, holy crap! Yeah, this is like this fits what I've always believed and whatever I always felt my whole life, right? And I feel like there's a lot of people out there like me that, you know, could deal, could uh, benefit from teaching Western. And uh, when I've spoken to Bonte G and Bonte Silananda about this, they, you know, they agree. They, um, they think that it's very good because they talk often about there is definitely a, there's not only a, a language barrier between the Sri Lankans and the Westerners, but there's also a cultural barrier that, you know, you, you, I listen to Bonte G talk, and, and you know, I, I laugh sometimes because he's funny, he says funny things, but it, it's a little different than listening to Ajahn Brahm talk, right? <laughs> There's almost like it's a, there is like a cultural divide, right? It, it's a little different to, you know, and, and if I, well, if I become a monastic, um, my goal is to enter Bhavana Society May 1st, 2014 um, with the intention to renounce. Uh, if I do become a monastic, if, if I'm allowed to to still come on the Buddhist Center, yeah, I will be. You know, because I plan on... You know, I, I belong to some forums. Uh, there's Dhamma Wheel. Um, there's, there's a couple different... And there's monastics on there. There's Theravada Buddhists in Sri Lanka in in Thailand and so I do know that there are monks who are on these forms well and this is the thing to me I feel like the internet is one of the best ways that has ever existed to, to teach Dhamma to spread Dhamma and to listen to Dhamma I listen to I've in, in my three, two, three years that I've started listening to stuff on the internet, I've probably listened to, with no exaggeration, almost a thousand videos. A couple hundred just on Ajahn Brahm himself. 
<laughs> but you know, and and you'll see a lot of that, um, you know, on my YouTube channel. You see all of the the playlists that I put together. Um, you know, every time I listen to a Dhamma talk from a specific monastic, I have a specific playlist for him. And and if I ever need to go back to it, it's like, what was that? Remember that talk that Bhante G said or whatever? I can just go right back to that playlist, and and there it is. You know, so the internet is an amazing tool uh, of benefit for spreading the Dhamma. And somebody who kind of, well, I didn't necessarily grow up with the internet because I remember when there was no computers, no cell phones, no, you know, I, I remember those days, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm 34, but I, I do remember when the world was like 100 years ago, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, um, but I still can, I think, maneuver the the Dhamma on the internet better than an older Sri Lankan monk, if you know what I mean. Um, you know, to be able to talk, at, but I also, I also think to myself, you know, I also wouldn't want to do that every day. If I became a monk, there's a lot of you're very, very busy, so I, I, I don't think I would have time to come on the internet every day. You know, I, I there's always a lot, a lot of things that I would be doing, um, but I would still want to be able to do that. Chopping wood, oh, you know it. I'm gonna be chopping wood. <laughs> I love chopping wood. <laughs> so uh, there's a um, one, one of the one of the jobs is the um, not stove master. What do they call it? Uh, basically, you're in charge of like keeping the fires going and all that stuff and moving moving the wood and all that. And, and I said that's what I when I live there. That's what I want my job to be because <laughs> that's a good job. But you know, but you know what though. They know that that's my job. So you know what my job is? To clean the bathrooms and to do all these other things <laughs> that I'd much rather not be doing as opposed to working with wood. But what is that doing? That's that's te that's a teaching in itself, isn't it? It's teaching you to to get rid of your likes and dislikes. Oh, you like you like chopping the woods. Okay, well you're never going to do it. <laughs> You're gonna do this instead, <laughs> but that's the way it is. They should be, but our mind says otherwise, right? All jobs at a forest monastery are equally important. That I will say. Forest monastery is a whole other beast from a regular monastery. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be done. So my, it is my hope that, uh, and, and I've seen that the Bhavanan Society does have computers. Um, I, I think uh, I will probably end up donating, you know, if I become a monastic, I have a couple of computers of my own that I can donate, add to the uh, the computer list. You know, it, it would probably be mostly me using it anyway. <laughs> so, might as well uh, donate. I know a few that chop wood. 